Nestled comfortably in between the World Junior Championships and the start of the playoffs, the NHL trade deadline is the hockey world's version of New Year's Eve. The lead up to the deadline is full of hope and excitement. Just like going to the New Year's Eve party that never lives up to the expectations, the trade deadline comes with the enchanting possibilities that maybe, just maybe, your team will make that one trade that will push them over the top, allowing them to capture that elusive Stanley Cup. The idea is so seductive that we dedicate hours of our day refreshing our phones until our thumbs are sore. Notifications are enabled, with our phones on loud just waiting for the insiders to drop a bomb that will rip the meaty flesh off of our faces. But unless your team was one of the lucky ones, most wake up the next morning disappointed, maybe having done something that they will regret for years to come. Happy Trade Deadline. By Design is a series that I've wanted to make for a while now because I'm fascinated by successful sports organizations and how they operate. Trust the process is a mantra that has become overused and almost villainized now, but how an organization or even an individual goes about making decisions is instrumental in accomplishing a goal at hand. How championship teams gather and apply information to create their best practices is what allows them to make the best decisions possible. This, in my opinion, is what separates the best organizations from the rest, and is what I hope to explore in this series. For the first episode, I thought it would be fun to take a look at how the 11 most recent Stanley Cup champions navigated their trade deadlines on their way to winning it all. This video is inspired by a 31 Thoughts article by Elliot Friedman and a video by Jay Cowman of The Ringer who discusses this topic but for the NBA. Links to both are in the description. I think it's important to understand some of the unique dynamics that make up a midseason trade and how it differs from a move in the offseason. The trade deadline creates a unique marketplace in that there's two distinct groups of teams looking to make deals. There are the buyers, who are looking for NHL quality players that can help them immediately in their hunt for the Stanley Cup, and on the flip side, there are the sellers, who are out of the playoff picture and have their eyes set on the future. But how does this differ from any other trade? And I mean, you could argue that there are always buyers and sellers, even in the offseason, which is true, but where the midseason trade differs from all other trades is the fabled trade deadline rental. The rental is one of the rare times when buyers and sellers' purest intentions intertwine. A rental player is, like the name suggests, acquired for short-term purposes. These are players on expiring contracts that would become free agents after the season is over. Rather than a selling team losing that asset for free, they elect to try and extract whatever value they can for the expiring player through a trade. Unlike the Blockbuster video franchise, Blockbuster rental trades are still going strong. Just last year, the Columbus Blue Jackets made multiple splashes in the rental market as they acquired Matt Duchesne and Ryan Dezingle from the Ottawa Senators two players in the primes of their careers. Going the other way, the seller's needs were met as they were able to acquire future assets in the form of prospects and draft picks, extremely valuable currency for any team investing down the line. There are two types of rental deals, and the first one is the depth trade. These are players who improve the bottom of the lineup and can fill in for injuries and whatever else comes your way in the playoffs. And if you really want to know why depth matters, just look at the 2011 Vancouver Canucks. That season, they used 14 different defensemen and got down to their ninth D-man in the playoffs. It was absolutely insane. Depth rentals from recent Stanley Cup winners are, in 2019, the St. Louis Blues traded a sixth round pick for Michael Delzato. He only played in seven regular season games and didn't set foot on the ice for the playoffs, but he still had his day with the cup. 2018 saw the Capitals get Jakub Yerbik, a veteran defender who only played two games for them in the playoffs. In 2017, the Pittsburgh Penguins showed up their blue line, acquiring Mark Streit for a fourth, and he played in three playoff games. The death rental doesn't drastically turn your team around overnight. They're the ones that shore up a team's weaknesses around the edges and give teams peace of mind that they can weather some injuries. The other type of rental deal is the all-in deal where GMs go big game hunting and sacrifice the farm for that player they think will get them over the hump. The Pittsburgh Penguins did this when they acquired Ron Hainsey in 2017 for a second and an AHL player. Hainsey played a crucial role in Pittsburgh's top four that year, averaging 21.07 a night in 25 playoff games. Chicago made a big splash in 2015, getting veteran blue liner Kimo Timonen for a second and a fourth. That year, they also traded a first-round pick and a mid-level prospect for Antoine Vermette. He was a face-off specialist that was able to play tough minutes and had 7 points in 20 playoff games. In 2011, the Boston Bruins made waves for trading for four-time All-Star Thomas Caberlet. 
This was for a giant package. The Leafs got a first, second, and Joe Colburn, who didn't really amount to much, but he was still a former first round pick. So what kind of trends have we seen Stanley Cup winners fall into over the last decade? The big thing is that there have been less all-in moves as of late, and more of a focus on reinforcing the periphery. By my count, only the Penguins and Blackhawks have made big moves since 2015, and only the Blackhawks have moved a first-round pick since that time. If we were to visualize every mid-season trade since 2009 and compare before and after 2015, a shift emerges. On average from 2009 to 2014, 12.2 second round picks were traded per year. From 2015 to 2019, only 8.6 second round picks were moved mid-season. What do these players all have in common? They were all taken with picks that were traded mid-season. Pre-2015, GMs were throwing second round picks left and right. But since then, general managers have been much more frugal. And can we blame them? As players get more and more expensive in a salary cap driven league, the draft has become more important than ever for finding and growing in-house talent that can be cheap to pay early in their NHL careers. The cost of trading for a rental is expensive, especially when you consider you're losing the player in the offseason. The other reason that makes the trade deadline rental difficult to get right comes down to economics. I would argue that normally the market is weighted towards sellers. As an example, let's take a look at this year's market for top 6 D-men. Along the x-axis, we have the quantity of top 6 defensemen, and on the y-axis, we have the price for said D-man in the form of draft picks. This is a crude example, but we can make it work. The downward sloping line represents the demand curve for top 6 defensemen, otherwise known as the Jim Rutherford curve. The positively sloping line represents the supply curve. We can call this the Sillinger Ashton curve as Mike Sillinger and Brent Ashton share a record for being traded 9 times each, the most of any player in NHL history. If the NHL was a perfectly efficient market, the point where supply meets demand would represent market equilibrium. But in reality, this point is just a delusional HF board trade proposal. In actuality, this year's market was inefficient. Andy Green is a bottom pairing rental defenseman who could play in the top four if need be. And when it was announced that Green was traded for a second round pick plus a prospect, consensus was that this was an expensive trade for the Islanders. Just earlier this year, Mike Riley was acquired by the Ottawa Senators, and I think he's arguably a better D-man than Green. He only went for a fifth rounder. Andy Green set the market for the trade deadline. He set a price floor for all others like him. Don't believe me? Marco Scandella was literally traded in January to the Habs for a fourth round pick, and then Mark Bergevin used some voodoo magic and went and traded him for a second and a conditional fourth. Blame Jason Botterill all you want for not getting enough for Scandella, but that is in part due to the market being set so high at this year's deadline. Without fully turning into an AP Econ teacher, here's the reason why deadline trades, and especially the deadline rental, are inefficient moves. When supply is equal to demand, the seller and buyer surplus is split evenly. The buyer surplus is the difference between the highest a buying team is willing to pay and the market price, and the seller's surplus is the difference between the market price and the lowest they are willing to trade their player for. With a price floor set above market equilibrium, we can see that the seller's surplus increases and the buyer's surplus decreases. In other words, selling teams see an increase in the difference between market price and the lowest price they are willing to trade at, whereas the buying team's differential decreases. Put simply, buying teams get less bang for their buck. Another effect that a price floor creates is a deadweight loss, which explains why some teams aren't able to move all of their rental players or why buying teams can't afford a trade. Take for example Dan Hamhuis at the 2016 trade deadline. The Canucks couldn't find a taker to buy him because the demand just wasn't there for their asking price. They ended up keeping him for the rest of the season, which was a cost to Vancouver because he walked away in the summer for nothing as well. And this is also a loss to a buying team as he could have very easily helped someone's playoff run on the bottom pair had the price been cheaper. There's one other trade that I think is the most interesting deadline move you can make if the stars align. This is the hockey trade. Different from a rental, the hockey trade isn't a chips in the middle, you only got one shot, do not miss your chance to blow trade, it's a move that helps a team win now and in the future. Examples of these deals are Michael Kempney in the Washington Capitals, Justin Schultz, Carl Hagelin, and Trevor Daly with the Penguins, Marion Gabrick with LA, Robin Regeer who the Kings traded for in 2013, Chicago got a young D-man in Johnny Oduya who was huge for them in 2013, in LA, the Kings got Jeff Carter, who was instrumental in LA's two cups, and they also got Dustin Penner, who helped them out in 2012. 
In 2011, the Bruins got Chris Kelly and Rich Peverly, who were key middle six players for them, and for a couple years afterwards. 2010, the Blackhawks stole Nick Letty from the Wild. The Hawks had also gotten Andrew Ladd at the deadline two years before 2010. And in 2009, the Pens maybe made the best deadline trade of all as they got Chris Kunitz, who would go on to win three Stanley Cups with the Penguins and play for eight and a half more seasons with them. They also got Bill Guerin that year, who was monstrous in their playoff run and stayed on for the year after. While harder to find, the hockey trade is by far the trade that pays the most dividends with the proper talent. If you can make it work where you can re-sign your rental player to a good contract, find a good young player, or trade for someone with term and cost certainty, those are the deals that make the most difference. I'm not arguing that teams should never buy a rental player at the deadline. As expensive as some rentals are, sometimes teams have to go for it. Now, I don't think Chicago, Boston, or Pittsburgh regrets the risk. And not all teams are created equal. In some cases, moves need to be made for the fans and the players. Take Columbus for example, a franchise that had never gotten out of the first round until last season. As Rick Sanchez says, To live is to risk it all. And the Blue Jackets made two giant deals landing Matt Duchesne and Ryan Dezingle because they wanted to take advantage of the final seasons of Sergei Bobrovsky and Artemi Panarin and give their fans some meaningful playoff hockey. They managed to be on the right side of history and swept the President Trophy winners to advance to the second round. What I'm arguing is that rental players are effective in moderation. I think definitive championship windows are being replaced in favor of lengthy playoff windows that stretch over years. Take a look at how long it took Washington and St. Louis to win, and how consistent Pittsburgh has been. It's important to note that all three of those teams have found a balance between buying through trade while also compiling prospects that can step in the lineup below market salary. I mean, the St. Louis Blues were sellers just two seasons ago. Pierre Lebrun of The Athletic had some interesting thoughts on this matter in a recent article where NHL teams are looking to compete for long longer rather than being all in at once. The thought process here is that instead of a two to three year Stanley Cup or bust window, teams would rather have seven to eight years of making the playoffs because you just never know what's going to happen once you get there as evidenced by recent cup winners. But then this year's deadline went away from the trends. 38 picks were traded from within the first four rounds, including seven firsts and 10 seconds. That's up from the 29.6 average of first to fourth round picks traded over the last four years. Teams this year are seeing that anyone can win in the playoffs, so why not them? And I think that's what makes this league so much fun. The fact that a team in last place in January can come all the way back and win it all, or a team that has been great for years but just unable to make it over the penguin-shaped hump finally having their day in the fountain. It's the idea that anything can happen in this league, and the enchanting possibilities of the trade deadline are part of that charm. Let me know your thoughts. Yeah, it's made with bits of real panther. So you know it's good. It's quite pungent. Oh yeah. Stings the nostrils. In a good way. Yeah. Brian, I'm gonna be honest with you, that smells like pure gasoline. 60% of the time, it works. <laughs>